Man, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of EOS. It's 10 out of Jake, man. I'm rocking with y'all. Let y'all rocking with me. For this episode, I'm going to be speaking on something that isn't the easiest to speak on because I still have demons that I fight regarding some of the situations within this story. Um, April 20th, 2012 was one of the craziest days of my life. A lot of crazy things happened in just that one day. And I'm going to start this story the day before, on the 19th. I had a friend at school named Alex. He was a Puerto Rican kid. He was quiet. He was humble. But this kid was bumping. I mean, this kid could fight. You know what I mean? And um, this was my main man at the time. Me and him were doing a lot of things together. A lot of things we shouldn't have been doing. But he was loyal and he was solid. And if I went, he went and vice versa. Unfortunately, I wasn't the... The best person to be around at the time. And um, because he was such a loyal person, I feel like I, I brought him into a lot of things that were unnecessary that I didn't need to bring him into. And I, I affected his life in so many different ways because I brought him into the bullshit. The things that I was doing just off the strength that, you know, he was a loyal person, he was a loyal friend. Whether it was me getting into a fight, whether it was me trying to do something I shouldn't have been, he was going to go just off the fact that I was going. And um, looking at how much responsibility I had at the time and not understanding the type of things that I was getting him into, I didn't predict what could happen. But Alex lived in Sulphur Springs. Sulphur Springs is a hood in North Tampa. Anyone from Tampa, you know about it. And he stayed on the corner of 11th and Yukon. And around this time, I was going to his house all the damn time. You know what I mean? I slept over. We would walk over to the meat market on Waters Ave. We would take his mom's EBT card and go and get whatever. And, um... It was it was rough, I'm not gonna lie. Like my house wasn't the greatest, but his house it was a little bit different because there wasn't there wasn't much furniture. You know what I mean? Like Alex had a mattress on the floor. There wasn't no chairs in his room. So when we was in his room, we was on the floor. The TV was on the floor, we had a GameCube on the floor, and you know, we play NFL Street. Jumping off the wall. We would just smoke and hang out. But, um, it was rough. You know what I'm saying? And we would find spoons in the kitchen that had burnt marks on them because his mother and her boyfriend at the time, you know, were, were shooting up. And Alex had a little brother that was, I believe, 11 years old at the time. We didn't necessarily want him to see all that shit. So if we saw something, we more or less tried to clean it up or whatever. But, I mean, we was young our damn selves. We must have been, what, 17 at the time? And the night that I slept over, um, I had a gun on me. I had a pistol, and we were bored as shit. We didn't really have nothing to do. We ran out of weed, and we were more or less just plotting and scheming on what could we get into or whatever. And Alex was like, yo, my mom got these pills in the room. If you want to take one of these, like, you're going to get high. You feel me? And at this time, I wasn't really, like, diving into all different pills. Like, I really didn't know the difference. I, I popped off with pills when I was, like, 15. I was a freshman in high school, and I used to sell ecstasy, you know what I'm saying, like, I used to get 500 beans, the beans of the X pills in Florida, and I would push beans as a jit, but, you know, I didn't really know what he was talking about, because I didn't know pills at the time, I didn't know what they really were like that, you know what I mean, so I was just like, oh, we're gonna get high, we're gonna get high, I'm thinking it was more or less along the lines of ecstasy, so he comes back in with this little ass pill, and I'm like, this is going to do it? And I could tell it was like a pharmaceutical pill because it didn't have a stamp on it. There wasn't a cartoon character or nothing like that, like, you know, the ecstasy pills would have. 
So we pop it. And, um, you know, within, I don't know, 5, 10, 15 minutes, my stomach is queasy as hell. I feel like I'm going to throw up. So I step outside. The second I walk outside, I start throwing up. And it was like, as soon as the vomit left my mouth, my whole body was just like... <laughs> I lean back up and I'm like, what is this? You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm gone. Like, I didn't know what I took, but it hit me fast. So I go back into the room. I'm like, bro, what is this? And I come back in and he's like glazed. You know what I'm saying? He's like, I told you, bro. I'm like, damn, this shit strong as hell. You know, so we high as fuck. We didn't really know what to do. We was just high, so we was like, you know, let's take a walk down Nebraska because Nebraska, if you're from Tampa, you know about Nebraska. There ain't nothing but just drug dealers and hookers and there's it, nothing good. But if you stay in the hood, there's always something entertaining to watch, whether it's hookers fighting or bums fighting or just random, you know, hood shit. And we had nothing better to do at the time. So I'm like, man, let's slide down to Nebraska. It's only a couple streets down, you know what I mean? So we decide we're going to go down there. But I'm like, hey, let me pop another one. He's like, you want another one? I'm like, yeah. Mind you, it's only been like 15 minutes since I threw up off of the first pill that I popped. So he goes in there. He gets another one. I throw it back. And we start walking all the way to Nebraska. Now, when we get to Nebraska first quarter, I mean, this traffic going, it's probably like midnight, one o'clock in the morning. So there's really no reason to be out here unless you up to no good, more or less. And, you know, I didn't have any weapons on me or nothing like that. I'm walking just me. But we got to a bus stop and I remember it clearly because he forgot something at the house. I think it was his phone or something like that. He was like, yo, I'm about to walk back and get it because it was just right up the street. So I'm like, I bet I'm going to sit right here. So I sit down at the bus stop. I was just sitting at the bench and I look down and I see a police car coming. And as he's getting closer, I start feeling this queasy feeling coming back to me like the first time when I threw up. And I'm like, oh, man, don't let me throw up in front of the police. They're going to pop out and, you know try to fuck with me, whatever it is. I swear to God, I'm watching the police car. By the time it gets right in front of me, I lean forward and throw up all over my black forces. Just... <laughs> and then I dumped it over the side. Now, mind you, the first time I threw up, it wasn't that much. It was just like a little bit. But this time, like my whole stomach emptied out. It's all over my shoes. The police car just kept going. They didn't even bother. You know, they're probably just looking like, oh, there's another one. You know what I mean? Strung out or some shit. I puke everywhere. And at this point, my body is just in another dimension. Like, I'm just floating, levitating, whatever you want to call it. Alex comes back. He's like, what the fuck happened? I was like, bro, this shit got me twirling. So we're just walking around or whatever. We slide back to his house. And um, I had the gun in his house. And it was a 32 pistol. It was an older pistol. Um, and for some odd reason, you know, I think it was probably from the pills. His little brother, who was 11 years old at the time, you know, he was in the room with us. We used to let him hit the blunt sometimes and whatever, whatever. But I asked him if he ever shot a gun before. He's like, nah. So I... Pulled out the pistol. I'm showing it to him. His eyes widen up. You know what I mean? So I asked Alice. I'm like, man, what's up? We gonna let him bust it? Alice is like, shit. You want to shoot it? So the little bro is like, hell yeah, hell yeah. So we step outside. We basically, we go down the side street and around the corner. There was a stop sign. And um, I cocked it for him. I handed it to him. And, you know, little bro held it up. He trying to get his aim right. Boom! The bit goes off. So he's like looking around. I'm like, man, shoot it again. He 
bust it again. Boom! So we're like, all right, come on. We're going to go back to the house. So we slide back to the house. You know, he's all excited and geeked up and shit. And um, we passed out. You know what I mean? We passed out. And I actually had to go back to my auntie's because I had a therapy appointment in the morning. So I took that same gun, and I think it was early in the morning, I slid back to my aunt's house. So my aunt had called my school and officially dropped me out of high school on this day when I was 17, on April 20th, 2012. So I'm officially a high school dropout. I'm on my way to my last therapy appointment. Um, while we're driving there, we get to Waters and Armenia. We get to the intersection. We go through the intersection, and my aunt's car got cut off by an SUV. So I flipped them off, and the guy actually stopped the car in front of ours and got out. And it was this older Chico dude. He's all tatted up with gold teeth. Oh, what's up? You want to say fuck me? Get out of the car. He didn't know I had the gun on me from the night before that got shot off. My aunt didn't know that either. And if I'm going to get out of this car and square off with this big ass Chico, this gun's going off and it's not going to end well. I was on probation at the time. All of this like popped off. I was on probation for hitting the jit. So this wasn't the best situation whatsoever. You know what I mean? So I stayed my ass in the car. And man, I felt like I took an ill in that situation. Like I felt like, you know, I was very prideful at this time. I was very caught up in the bullshit. I was my own worst enemy because I would critique myself to the point that I would lash out and do something that I would later regret Just because I would let my pride chew me up inside. But I didn't get out of the car. Wait out the pros and the cons. I'm not going to get out in the middle of traffic and start dumping off animal probation. This isn't going to end well. We end up getting to my therapist. And this is the story that I've told y'all before. I hug my therapist. It's the last day. And I drop the fucking gun in the middle of the doctor's office. And everyone's just looking. And I picked it up. I was like, oh, it's a BB gun. And she's like, I hope so. We get back into the car. My aunt isn't even looking at me. She's like, show me it's fake. And I, I I, went to pull back the slide just a little bit. Like, oh, that's where you put the BB. But she didn't even look. Like, she just kept driving. So by the time we get back to the house, I go to Chamberlain High School because that's where I'm going to link up with Alex. Alex is still in school. And it's 420, you know what I'm saying? Like, we're all going to hang out. We're all going to smoke. We're going to get high. We're going to chill. We're going to vibe. So, I go to Chamberlain High School. You know, I just walked over. When I get there, I literally walked into the school. Because it was, it must have been like 11 or something like that. But people was in chow. Or not chow. Fucking lunch. It was was lunchtime. You know what I'm saying? So I walk into the chow hall, and when I go in there, I can see, like, way further back, there's the principal, the assistant principal, and then they got the cop, you know, that works at the school or whatever. But I see all my people right here to the left, and I see one of my dogs named Tomas. Shout out to Tomas if he watches this. And he's sitting with a whole table full of females. So I'm like, what's up, bro? You finna slide to the library at the school? Because that's where everybody used to hang out at was North Tampa Library, like... Everybody that was somebody would go to North Tampa Library. That's where everyone fights at, plays football, whatever, whatever. He's like, yeah, yeah, I'm going to be there. I lifted up my shirt inside of the chow hall, and he looks, and he sees the pistol that I got on me. I had it on my hip. And every girl at the table that's with him is like, and he's looking. He's like, yo, you got to let me bust that shit. I'm like, man, I got you. Da-da-da-da-da. Like, this is why I say I was so bold and stupid at the time, because I didn't give a fuck that I was inside of a school I no longer go to with a gun on me, holding my shirt up like I'm Billy Badass. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I just had no consciousness at the time. And um, school ends or whatever. School gets out. Everybody links up at the little corner store across the street from the train tracks. We're over at the library. And we start walking back to Alex's house. 
So we get to Alex's and there's a whole bunch of us here. Everybody's smoking. We're all getting high. And as everyone started to leave, it was just me, Alex, and a white boy named Brad. Now, Brad, I used to be cool with, and I believe I actually met Alex through Brad, but me and Brad kind of fell out. Like, he just, I don't know, he just became funny to me. Like, he just wasn't a hundred to me, you know what I'm saying? And, um, but he was there, you know what I'm saying? We not really saying too much or whatever, and we decide that we're going to walk to the meat market to go get blunts. So, you know, we asked Brad, hey, you finna come? He's like, no, nah, I'll stay right here. He was kind of like on some scary shit. Like, I mean, there was a situation. I probably can tell this as another story, but there was a situation where me, Alex, and Brad had to walk all the way through West Tampa, all the way to Robles Park, which is in East Tampa, which is a whole nother project. They actually beef. So we had to go through the North Boulevard homes, the West Tampa projects, the ones that were torn down. We had to walk through them shits and then go all the way over to Robles before we could make it all the way back to Sulphur Springs in North Tampa. Shit was crazy, but he was scary as hell the whole time we did that shit. Like, he was panicking and shit. But, uh, anyway, he doesn't want to go to the corner store. So, me and Alex are like, alright, we finna go. And I take the gun with me. Now, we get to the store, no problem. Like, we gotta go up Yukon. We hit 12. We go down 12 to Waters. And then the store is right there. So, we get to the meat market. We caught the blunts. Now, we're coming back. And as we're coming back on another side street, the side street next to the South of Springs Elementary School, there's a group of people walking, you know, towards us and they start like yelling shit out. They're all black. You know what I mean? I'm white as can be. Alice is Puerto Rican, but he a light skinned Puerto Rican. They get the yelling shit out and it sounds like they want pressure. You know what I'm saying? Alex had never shot the gun off at the time, so I had actually let Alex carry the gun because he was going to bust that shit one time when we got back to the house just to do it. So he's got the gun on him, and we're walking down the street. I'm inside. He's outside, so he's closer to the curb. They start yelling shit over to us. We know it's pressure. We know it's a problem. You know what I mean? And there's a whole group of them, like 10 people. And, um, you know, I tell Alex, I'm like, hey, bro, bust that shit. Fuck it. He's like, nah, Bill. I'm like, man, bust that shit. He's like, you bust it. I'm like, all right, give it to me. So he lifts up his shirt. He grabs it. He passes it to me. When he passes it to me, I move him out of the way. I went to busting that shit. Boom, 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 boom. So, you know, this shit's going off. This shit's loud as fuck. Everybody stops running. I mean, this car's going by and everything. And um, I'm busting this shit as, like, I'm walking over to Yukon so we can turn that corner. The gun jams. So it jams, and I got to cock this shit because the bullet got caught. Like, it didn't cycle back into the, into the barrel. So I, you know, cock it back, the bullet falls out, and the next one cycled right in. So as I'm turning onto Yukon, you know, I busted probably like two more times. The hell, seven shots, you know what I mean? And we had a whole box of bullets because we stood outside of a fucking Walmart and asked some random Mexican dude to buy us bullets, and he went in there, bought them shits for us, came back out, and then gave me the fucking change, like... Shit was gangster. Like, he didn't ask no questions or nothing. I said, I need 32 ACPs. He walks in that shit, gets 32 ACPs, comes back out, and gives me the change. Like, that's how easy it is to get ammo in Florida. It takes two seconds, no license needed, no questions asked. So I had mad bullets, you know what I'm saying? But as I turn the corner shooting, I look. And the very first house on this street was like a bando. It was like a trap house. And there was this girl outside, but I don't want to say the word because it can be offensive, but she dressed like a man. She had dreads, big ass block earrings full of diamonds, gold teeth, gold jewelry, and she was on the phone. So as I turned shooting the gun, she looks at me and her mouth just drops. She's like, and I'm turning shooting and I look and see her. I'm just like, oh shit. So, you know, the last shot goes off, that shit stays back, you know what I'm saying? I try to, like, 
put it in my pocket, but because the slide was back, like I couldn't really like fit it in my pocket. So I just stopped running and his house is halfway at the end of the street, you know, on 11th. So we're just booking it down Yukon and then we jumped right inside of his house. We got into his house, put the gun up in the closet. Now it only took like maybe, I don't know, five to 10 minutes. And Alex's house, the windows had bars on them. So we see a shadow. So we look out the blinds and it's the police and they got guns on the window. So they start yelling, come outside, come outside. So we shut the blinds. We're like, oh shit. So we start moving shit. Like we got to move the grinder, the weed. He had a weed plant inside of his closet. He goes and tells his mom. He's like, yo, the crackers is here. Da, da, da. She's got shit inside of her room. So come to find out the pill that we took, it was a perk 30. That was my first time ever taking a perk 30, first and last. I took two of them shits back to back. So that's why I was so, you know, fucked up that night. But I didn't even know I was taking a perk. So she got perks in her room and shit. She's trying to hide like needles and shit like that. We put the weed plant inside of her room. We got the gun and the bullets inside of the fucking, in the closet or whatever. So everybody's panicking. His mama goes out there and she more or less tells us like, you know, we got to come outside. So we go outside. They grab me. They grab him. And um, everybody's more or less talking. I'm cuffed up. He's cuffed up. And his mom is bawling, crying. And they're basically just saying, where's the gun? Where's the gun? We know you have it. Where is it? Da-da-da. She's like, what the fuck are they talking about, Alex? Like, she starts crying and shit. And there was mad neighbors that came outside. Like, it was kind of a big deal. So the police walked me over to where the neighbors was at. And it was another police officer with the neighbors. And I guess that's when they were asking, like, oh, is he the person that you saw firing the gun? But what's crazy is no one said that we did it. Like, I don't... Whoever called said we went inside of this house, but no one in the neighborhood pointed us out for shooting the gun off. And, um... You know, the main officer that was there, he's talking to Alex's mom. He's like, listen, is this Section 8? She's like, yeah. And, you know, he tells her, if we get a search warrant and we find that gun inside of there you can be taken off of Section 8. This is going to affect your whole family. And she just starts bawling. And I'm just thinking to myself, like, like I, I caused this whole situation. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's my gun. I shot it. So I got to take responsibility. So she's asking him, she's like, Alex, where is the gun? He ain't saying shit. Like I said, he was real loyal. He wasn't saying nothing to the point that he even teared up, you know, looking at his mother crying, you know. So I told the officer, like, it's it's my gun, sir. And he's like, where's the gun at? Where's the gun at? And I just kept repeating myself, like, it, it's my gun. It's my gun. You know what I mean? Like, I just, I wanted to make that clear. I didn't want anything to fall back on them and their family. And she asked, you know, his mom asked, where's the gun? And I told her where it was at. I said, I put it in the closet. So she moved to go get it. And the officer was like, oh, no, 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 don't do that. Can we come? Because we need to grab it. We don't want you to touch it. So, you know, more or less, they went in there and they came out with the gun. And, um, you know, the officer was trying to tell me beforehand. He was like, you know, just tell me where it's at. You won't get in any trouble. I'm like, can you put that in writing? He's like, nah, I can't do that. I was like. I know I'm going to get in trouble. So I told him where the gun was. They come out. They got the gun. He asked me, you know, where did you get it? And I told him that there was an abandoned house. I either said 13th or 15th. I forget. But there was a duplex and it was actually abandoned. And there was a couch behind it. And I remember I went behind this place, you know, probably like a week before. And I took a piss. And I told the police I took a piss. While I was pissing, I seen something glistening under the couch and I pulled it out and it was a gun. And, you know, he was like, why were you shooting the gun off? I told him, I was just like, I was just shooting it off just to shoot it off. I wasn't shooting at nobody. I regretted it the second I said that because I admitted to shooting it. But at the same time, I was saying, you know, I was just shooting the gun off. I didn't say I was shooting at nobody or anything like that. And, um... 
You know, it's funny because no one said I was shooting at anyone. Nobody said anything about that. You know what I'm saying? No one said anything crazy. I was just like, I was just busting it off. And I already knew the charge for discharging a firearm in public is a misdemeanor. There was a school right there that could heighten up the charge, but discharging a firearm isn't that big of a deal. But there's a fine line between that and attempted murder. So me, Brad, and Alex were all taken in different police vehicles, and we're basically taken down to this police fucking interrogation room. And it looks exactly like First 48, but... There wasn't a table, there wasn't a fucking, you know what I'm saying, like a, a fucking Coke and a cigarette and all that shit. It was nothing like that. There was a table that the detective sat at, and then there was a cage that they put me in. So I sat down in a cage, and I'm cuffed up in this cage, and you know, the detective comes in, and she was this ugly alligator looking bitch. She had Botox lips, the ugliest female I've ever seen. And she came in and was just flat out like, you're going to be charged with seven counts of attempted murder. And my jaw fucking dropped. I was like, what? She's like, seven counts of attempted murder. You need to tell me everything that happened, da da da. So I'm just like, you got me fucked up. You know what I mean? Now I tell her, I'm not trying to talk. I just want to, you know, if I'm going to jail, I'm going to jail. It is what it is. And she tells me, she's like, you know, one of your friends already told on you. I'm like, what are you talking about? She's like, your friend Brad, he said you had a gun on you earlier that day. What's crazy about this, right, is you know that the police will use tactics to be like, oh, your friend told on you, so you might as well tell us what it is. Brad knew that I had the gun earlier that day because when we all met up at the library, I took it out. And that was the first time Brad ever seen that gun. He knew I had it on me earlier that day. And it's crazy how she said it. Because she didn't say him and Alex. She just said Brad. And you know, I tell her basically I'm not saying nothing. I want a lawyer, whatever, whatever. They took me out and put me back in the police car. They had Alex in the car in front of mine. They had Brad in the third car. They took us back to Alex's house. None of us were charged with anything. Discharging a firearm was a misdemeanor. We didn't get charged with that. I didn't get charged with no fucking attempted murders, nothing. I thought I was getting hit with seven counts of that shit. I didn't get charged with that. They took the gun, confiscated it, whatever they did with it. It wasn't reported stolen at the time. That's all it was. And when I got dropped off back at Alex's house, his mother came up. She hugged him. She hugged me. She was so happy to see us. I talked to Alex. He was like, bro, I wasn't saying nothing to them, da-da-da. And I told him about the shit with Brad because Brad ended up going home. You know, he went to his house. And Alex was like, man, that shit sound funny as hell. Like, you know, because he wasn't even involved in any way. So he really didn't even need to say anything other than he was just scared. But we didn't get charged with a damn thing. I didn't even get a gun charge out of this. Now, I had to ride my bike home that night because I was on probation and I had a curfew. And I actually made it home before curfew, tired, sweating. And I didn't tell my aunt nothing about what took place. Nothing about the shooting. Nothing about going down to the investigation, whatever. Nothing. She had no idea about any of this. Fast forward, I end up getting sentenced to a program. So I'm in a program in Orlando. And during this time, my aunt came to visit me, and she tells me that Alex was locked up. He was charged with an armed burglary. He was charged with possession of a firearm. I believe there was one more charge. And I'm trying to think about how the hell he got charged with that. Like, what, what was it? What was the reason that, you know, what happened that he would get charged with that? But she didn't know. She didn't have the answers for me, and I was pissed off. So I ended up escaping the program. It had two double doors, right? It had two locked doors. Both of them were open because one person was coming in and a staff member left the second door open. So I ran out of the program and I hauled ass. You know what I'm saying? Like, 
I got lost in Orlando, more or less. The police end up picking me up. It was a crazy-ass night. I mean, that's a story for itself. But just to fast forward and stay on point with this story, I get picked up by the police. And, you know, when I get picked up by the police, I actually had warrants out of Hillsborough County. I'm burglary, possession of a stolen firearm. I'm like, how the fuck? You know what I'm saying? Like... I have the same charges that Alex has right now. Like, what the fuck just happened? So I go to the juvenile detention center in Orlando. I'm transferred back to the juvenile detention center inside of Tampa. And I'm going to court for this shit. Everything starts to come into play now. The gun that they got off of me, that I shot off by his house, wasn't reported stolen at the time. That gun was later reported stolen and warrants were sent out. They went and picked him up. They scooped him on the warrant. They locked him up. When I got popped by the police in Orlando, that's when they got me on the warrant. I'm going to court for this shit. You know, when you're in juvie or whatever, it's they call it dub. It's 20 days. Your first day counts. It's really 21, but your 20th day is when they decide either to sentence you in juvenile court, adjudicate you to adult court, uh, everything's gone. So I go to court my 21st day. And, uh, you know, the prosecutor prosecutor goes up to the stand and more or less tells them, you know, we don't have any new evidence, no new confessions, no new witnesses. We would like to move to have all charges dismissed. They dropped the charges against me, the arm burglary, the possession of a firearm. I was let out of juvie. Alex ended up getting sentenced to a year in county and I believe he had probation after that. I forget how much probation. They said they found his fingerprint on a safe from the house that that gun was stolen. And um, that was the case that they tried to get me on. But, you know, like I said, Alex is a, a solid individual. He didn't say shit. He took his charge. And it is what it is. When I got out. We went to Alex's house to to just check up on his people, to check up on his mother, to check up on his little brother. And the boyfriend came outside. And when he came up, we asked, you know, where's his mother at? And he tells us that she passed away. And we were all just shocked. Like, what? The f- what the fuck you mean? Like, what happened? She passed away from an overdose while Alice was in jail. And, um, I didn't know how to take it because, you know, later that night, I got, I got real high and I was sleeping on the couch just thinking about everything. And one of my people called me and I'm talking to him and I'm like, bro, is it my fault that that she's dead? Because, you know, we knew she was using, but had I had not did what I did and brought him into that shit, did I cause her extra stress that made her use even more? And I caused the overdose and I was just running so many things through my head about her death. Like, I I felt like I caused it. I felt like I was to blame for her dying. Um, I felt like I did it. And to this day, you know, I still feel like I had something to do with it. Like, I have, I'm responsible for what happens. And it was only within a couple of months I end up going to prison. You know, I sent Alex care packages when he was in county. Um, while I was in prison, I would ask my aunt to, to look him up and see if she could find out anything about him and let me know how he's doing. And I never knew how Alex would react to me reaching out to him. I never knew if it would be 
animosity. I never knew he would want to kill me. I never... Because, I mean, me and him, we did so much shit together. We could have caught multiple life sentences, all the shit that we did. I was there with him when he got his mother's name tatted. You know, I was with him when he, when he first got gold teeth, all type of shit. We made a lot of money together. We did a lot of shit together, but that was his mother. And... It was just, it was, it, it still fucks me up thinking about it. Seeing dude's face, like when he told us that she was dead and then everyone in the car kind of just like looked back at me to see my reaction to it. And I was, I was just as shocked. You know, the little brother, he had to move in with a different family member. And, um, it was crazy. And, you know, when I got out of prison, I actually, I, I found a couple of Facebooks that had his name and I reached out to them and I never got a message back. And then one day I did. I got a message back from bro. We started talking. You know, I told him, like, bro, like, I carried your name everywhere I went. Everywhere I went, I told people about you, how real you was, how solid you was. And I expressed, you know, my apologies for the loss of his mother. And he didn't, he didn't blame me at all. He was at peace with what happened. You know, it's like I said, he's solid on another level. He's very mature. He ended up actually going to prison too. He told me he never once got into a fight in prison. He didn't have to go to the youth offenders. He went to the adults. Never had an issue his whole bid. He got out. He's been working. He's doing good. And, you know, possibly in the future, we were trying to run an interview, but just shit happened and we weren't able to pop off with the video. But hopefully sometime in the future, we can run that. And y'all can hear the story from his point of view, but this is why it's so important for people to listen to these types of videos because it's not always you that your choices affect permanently. Your choices can affect the people that are around you. And you may have somebody in your circle that's so loyal and such a good person at heart and has so much love for you that they're going to follow you through whatever. And you have to understand the responsibility of being a good friend. That if you're on a self-destructive path, you're going to lead that person to that same destruction. And I'm fortunate enough to be able to still talk to him, to still be able to say, what's up? You know what I mean? But it still bothers me to this very day, knowing that I brought him into so much shit and that my actions caused him to get locked up, caused his mother to pass away, caused his little brother to get moved into another... You know what I'm saying? Like, his little brother was 11 years old. His mother died. You know what I mean? Like, and I don't know if he found her. I don't know if the boyfriend found her. I don't know. I try not to think of it. Because the more I think about it, the more it fucks me up. And, you know, out of all the violent things that I've done in my life, I always sought an emotion out of it. People that I hurt, people that I tried to do things extremely violent to. I never got a feeling from it. I never got satisfaction. I never felt like more of a man out of anyone that I've hurt. But what happened to her bothers me to this day. And it's something that I have to live with for the rest of my life. So I hope y'all are able to learn something from this story. And listen to these life experiences and take the knowledge that's inside of them 
break down these life experiences and understand how temporary pleasure, the money, the girls, whatever we had, the highs, it can turn into a lifelong pain and things that you have to deal with. You know, you don't feel the satisfaction from the robbery or from the weed you smoked 10 years ago, but you feel the pain from the loss that you cause and that sticks with you for life. But hey, it's 1090J. I'm rocking with y'all. Y'all rocking with me. Till next time.